Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ramy Martin Galiatovich. I am the program director at the Center for Positive Leadership. I think this is our sixth leadership tool showcase, and I see a lot of new faces, so I'm really glad about that. Um, so what we do today is we're gonna demonstrate four of our leadership tools um, that are related to burnout. So um, a couple housekeeping things I wanna share with you. Um, the bathroom, if you haven't already found it, is down the hall to the right and then to the left. The women's is the first one on the left, which is most important, right? Um, and you have in your folder all the tools that are gonna be presented today by our various speakers. Um, what you don't have is a copy of the PowerPoint, but there's a QR code on your agenda, and you can just use that and pull the PowerPoint if you'd like now or later. And also the tools are in that folder as well for you to keep. All our tools currently are free at the Center for Positive Leadership, so I encourage you to use them back in your workplace or in your classrooms. And we have four speakers today, Daniel Montgomery, Patty Vider, I said that correctly, yes, Melissa Brock, right here, and Brad Schock. But um, Daniel's gonna do the introductions for them, and I am gonna quickly tell you really quickly about the Center for Positive Leadership. So if you didn't know about us already, we are housed over at the College of Business. Our mission is to increase positive leadership in the world, and we do this by several initiatives, and one of them is a new one, it's called a Local World Changers Groups. Um, we are also, um, we are, working with these groups who are intrinsically motivated to solve problems in the Metro Louisville community, and we are teaching them through the framework of positive leadership. We also, again, you're here today because of our free leadership tools. We have those, including a smartphone application that we're currently using with the Local World Changers group. We have showcases. This is our showcase today. Um, we also have the Tyre Family Distinguished Conversation Series, which we bring in speakers quarterly around the, the topic of positive leadership and leadership in general. Um, we, we have Rector Fellows in Positive Leadership. Currently, we have an RFP out there, if anybody's interested, where we fund people to do research in leadership. And we have a group of affiliated professional, professionals, excuse me, all four of our speakers here today are one of those affiliated professionals. They collaborate with us around all of our initiatives at the center, including creating the tools. And then we also do book clubs, where we read books on leadership and then work with alumni and other employees across campus having book clubs. So that is us in a nutshell. I wish I could talk to you more, but I would recommend, you don't have to QR this right now, but it's in the PowerPoint. We are on um, YouTube. We, we post um, recordings of all our events on YouTube. We have Facebook, that's new for us. We're working towards Instagram, and we also do LinkedIn. So follow us, and you will hear more about what we do on a daily basis. All right, but before we do Brad, I'm gonna let Daniel come up here and do his part. Good morning. Good morning. While you're doing that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Daniel Montgomery, and I'm with Leadership Reality. We're a learning and development agency um, do all things development. So we do organizational development, helping companies with business design strategy, designing out their strategy that contextualizes the, the voice of their leadership team um, with the voice of the employee. So we do team development, we do executive development, and all our work is custom development. And so we find that people prefer stuff that's not off the shelf, but sounds like them and looks like them. And, uh, reflects who they are and their values and vision and mission. All right, everyone's getting in there. Keep it coming. But yeah, our, our passion in a nutshell is to bring work to life and life to work. We've been partnering with the University of Louisville and Ryan and Ramey the, this past year and it's been a total joy. So it's truly an honor to be here. And uh, yeah, good morning. How many of y'all are morning people? Good, I'm a morning person, I'm ready to go. Yeah, let's go. All right, what do you love about fall? What do you love, this is a practice, just to make sure it's working. What do you love about fall? What do you love about fall? Keep them coming. 
Ah, sweater weather, football, cool weather, leaves, Halloween, smell of leaves, activities, sweatshirts, new start, clean, crisp air. Oh, we've got, we've got one, fires. I have fires. So it's going to come at the end, but just so you're not wondering what the, the fire in the middle is about. It's about fall, but it's also about uh, what we're hoping for at the tables. So think of like, you know, backyard fires. You know, backyard fires where you can have real conversations. You're comfortable. Uh, hopefully today you can just lean in with the conversations. We want to make clear whatever activity we walk you through, um, you have freedom to share whatever you're comfortable sharing. Um, we are in full recognition that the topic of burnout is a loaded topic. And it can be close to, to many of us. I mean, if you're not in the midst of burnout, um, I'm sure you know people that are experiencing burnout. Um, and it's something that we're going to bring a, a lightness to, but whenever we bring a lightness to it, we recognize the weight as well. So next question, you know, what's your burnout temperature? So you've got some options here. You've got um, blazing bright, I'm thriving, I'm full of energy. Uh, and then maybe you're warm and steady. I'm feeling the pressure, but holding steady. Simmering slowly, I'm, I'm, I'm close. I'm close to my tipping point. And then maybe you're just cool and ashen, burned out in need of rejuvenation. Or you're, you're igniting change. I'm ready, I'm ready to bring it. I um, mean, you can choose multiple. Huh? We, we are complex creatures as humans, and so, there you go. So inevitably, when we do a burnout temperature, working with executives, it's all over the place, or leaders. But when you start to kind of really check in with one another, there's a range of emotions. There's a lot going on. The typical how are you is, is more than just fine. Um, there's always a lot going on in the room. And so it's something to keep in mind. While some of us are here to spark change, some of us here hopefully are here to do work. Um, the only work we can do, the most essential work, whether you're dealing with a toxic culture or a transformative culture, is our own work. And so the, the goal is a better me, better you, better us, better all. Um, but hopefully we can I mean, ignite change beginning with ourselves. Wherever you're out on the reality of burnout, 52% um, of people globally are experiencing burnout, like right now, real time. Um, it moves up to 67% of respondents say that at their current workplace, they've experienced burnout sometime uh, in, the, in the past. Workplace-related stress takes 120,000 lives annually. That's a, that's a good-sized city that goes down because of stress. It costs our economy $300 billion, the cost of stress in the workplace. And, and the statistics and numbers are significant and staggering. But what, what's more significant is that those numbers represent people. They represent real stories. I, I think of um, the executives in their, their 60s who, uh, whose lives and job and career and calling were once marked by joy and a contagious enthusiasm. But now it's an increasing cynicism. Now that, that, that could be burnout. I think of the, the CFO who they call the machine because she can carry the workload of three people. And she just wants to be human. And every spreadsheet, every financial report, it's just she's exhausted. That's burnout. I think of the rising tech stars. And at one time, they were marked by this, this shining bright light. And now they're just like an asteroid headed to Earth. That's burnout. I, I think of, you know, we're in a university. I think, of, I think of college students who have traded Red Bull for Adderall. And not, not prescribed by a doctor Adderall, but prescribed by their friends. Upwards of 
of college students who are not adults, it's from a friend or a friend of a friend. Now, why, why are we here? We're here, let me, let me boil it down to three reasons. We're first here because of you. We believe that you, today's worker, deserve a workplace where you can thrive. Not, not merely where we're seeking just to survive and make it to another day, but where we thrive, where, where work doesn't suck our soul of energy, but rejuvenates us and energizes us and allows us to bring our presence and presence fueling more and better performance. We're here because there are piles of research. There is no end to ideas and good ideas and well thought out ideas. But there's a need to translate those ideas into actionable insights and toolings and tactics for real change. And that's what the leadership tool showcase is all about. That's the genesis. That's the origin story. Hey, can we get some real time leadership, real tools, real tactics? And we're not here by any stretch of the imagination saying, do this and you will overcome burnout. We're in the trenches. These are test and learn tools where, hey, we've worked this out in the laboratory and it may have worked at times. Well, why don't you try it out? But if you can leave here with, with, a, with some tooling, some tactics, some insights, we win. You win. We all win. We're, we're here because we recognize that burnout isn't just a me issue. It's not just an individual issue. It's a we issue. It's a social issue. It's a systemic, it's a cultural issue. And while a lot of the, the tactics and conversation today are not going to be um, principally about bringing um, change to the system and governance and policy, um, it's about you, but we recognize the system. In fact, there's a, an appendix that I think it's titled, um, it's, it's not just about you. I think it's what we titled it. It's in, it's in your notes. And what do I do if, if I feel powerless to not change the system? The reason we're focusing on the individual is because we believe that's where we can bring the most rapid change. And so I want to introduce our team. All right, and so I want to begin with Patty Wider. Patty, would you come on up? Patty is, let's give it up for Patty, come on. <laughs> Patty's a, a trained clinical psychologist, and over the past 10 years, she, I, I want to title you the, the chaos pilot, because Patty is comfortable stepping into difficult environments, and whether it's work in DEI, well-being, change management, um, Patty's in a, a different league. Um, how many people work at the VA? Uh, four, well, Veterans Health is 400,000. Yeah, 400,000. <laughs> so you're talking governance and policy, big, big change management. Um, today she is presenting to us on humility. Um, this is a, a leader who truly models what she messages. To, to sit in Patty's presence is to experience humble inquiry. So next we have Melissa Brock. Give it up for Melissa Brock. Uh, Melissa Brock is a trained positive psychology coach, um, also internal family systems, somatic coaching, as well as um, positive intelligence. And so after 10 years of bringing her unique perspective to Humana uh, and everything from communication and well-being to DEI, she set off on her own with Melissa Brock Consulting. And so now she does executive development, team development, uh, and she's an incredible leader who from day one, someone shared with me, oh, oh, curiosity, you need to meet Melissa. You need to meet Melissa. And so my hope today and expectation is that the virus of curiosity would spread. We need good contagions. And that it would spread first here with ourselves and then to our workplaces. Finally, we have Dr. Brad Shuck. Give it up for Brad Shuck. <laughs> Dr. Brad Shuck. Um, is a prolific author, uh, over 300 publications in peer-reviewed journals, book chapters, presentations. He, uh, his book is, oh gosh, it's escaping me. Employee. Employee Engagement, a research overview. Yes, I bought it. Oh. I did, it's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive, but it is solid. It's thin, it's thin. 
So you can work through it. It's actually readable. Uh, you don't have to be just a nerd to enjoy it. Um, but Brad, Brad is unique. He's not just a big brain. He, he's very engaged. And so whether it's um, Fortune 500 companies who have applied his research, or he's a co-founder in Org Vitals, which is all about bringing good analytics, healthcare, preventative healthcare analytics to work, and work to healthcare analytics. Um, he's the, the full package. And he leads us in compassion, so he's head, hands, and heart. And a lot of heart in leading us in a much needed conversation of how do we bring love and compassion to the workplace? I mean, even saying love. Can we talk about love in the workplace? Um, I believe we can, and uh, that's where we're going to lead today. So whether we're talking about curiosity or compassion or humility, these all intersect in grounding a critical topic. I mean, this is a, we believe burnout is a wicked problem, a difficult, challenging problem, a systemic issue that calls for character. And that's what the Center for Positive Leadership is all about. How do, how do we ground real meaningful change in character, you know, our character. And today we're going to look at humility, compassion, curiosity, and play. I'll be working play today. And so we want to introduce the topic of burnout with a tool. And so if you open up uh, your red folder, it should be on the left. And it's titled Fact versus Fiction. So the, the genesis of this tooling um, is burnout sort of a trigger word. Like you can't talk about burnout in a lot of work environments. Are you tracking with me? You can't, you can't talk to all your bosses about burnout. Um, it's, it's a term that we've found in our experience that we have to navigate carefully if we want to bring change. Know, because it can get really political. And if some of you are like, I don't do politics, we all do politics. You know, politics is just how we work with our neighbors and coworkers. And so if there's more than two people in the company you work with, um, it's a political organization, right? And, and how are we going to use our power? And you might be here today and say, I don't have power. No, power is simply the ability to move energy through a system. So we all have power. We have storytelling power. Some of us have positional power. But the power is at, at play. So the question is, how are we using our power? Well, we would encourage, in introducing the topic, it's just to make sure everybody's on the same page regarding what are the, what's the science behind burnout and what's the misinformation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work through the science of burnout. Fiction versus fact. And the way we typically work this tool, you can just put a little note. Um, we say, hey, read it in a voice um, that reflects fiction or fact. And so I'm going to get us started. Um, and what we want you to do as you're, as you're working through this is get your pen out. And we want you to circle or underline whatever registers with you regarding the fiction or fact. What are the, what are the fictions regarding burnout that you wrestle with most? What are, the, what are the fictions that your team, colleagues, wrestle with most? And so I'll get us started. Uh, first fiction number one, burnout is just about being overworked. While it's tempting to attribute burnout solely to excessive workloads, the reality is more nuanced. Burnout is multidimensional. Scientific research points to burnout as a multifaceted problem. Yes, a high workload can be a contributing factor, but so can a lack of control, insufficient reward, workplace community disconnection, unfair treatment, and values misalignment. We are complex creatures, and so is burnout. Awesome. I'll take two. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's good to see you. All right, let's do number two. Number two, burnout is simply, look, this is a personal problem. This is your issue. You need to like work your way through this. Like leave that stuff at the door. Actually, what the science tells us is that burnout is a systemic issue. It's bigger than just the person. More and more, we recognize that burnout 
arises from a mismatch between the job and the person, or maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe a mismatch between you and a coworker, <laughs> or you and a neighbor, or you and a community member, right? Burnout is much bigger than just a personal issue. It's much more systemic. Number three, burnout is the result of poor time management. Hey, just pull it together. Like, just manage your time better. Can't you do that? Get a watch. Get a planner. Burnout is just a result of poor time management. Here's what, I, here's what this implies, is that if you were just better at organizing your time, you could probably just navigate all this. Like you, could, you could figure out how to juggle all this. Actually, what we see is that it's about autonomy. The science would tell us that burnout is related to a sense of agency and job autonomy. Researchers find that a lack of control or autonomy in one's contribution significantly relates to burnout. My ability to have some level of influence and control and agency and some level of decision-making power in the moment is directly related to this idea of burnout. So I'll turn it over to Melissa for four. Good morning. So fiction number four is that burnout is unavoidable in certain jobs, certain industries. This assumption leads to a sense of helplessness and resignation about burnout. So it's not helpful and it's not true, right? The fact is effective workplace practices can mitigate burnout. Scientific studies highlight the power of effective workplace practices, such as acknowledging and praising contributions, fostering good relationships, and promoting fairness. These actions can greatly reduce the risk of burnout, no matter the profession. Fiction number five, more money will solve burnout. <laughs> so many assume that higher salaries or financial rewards can cure burnout. Um, and there's a lot of organizations, some of y'all might have worked with them or for them, that throw money at problems. That's, that's the solution, right? The fact is, recognition and purpose play key roles. While fair compensation is essential, research tells us that recognition, a sense of purpose, and alignment with organizational values are equally, if not more, important in pre preventing burnout. Fiction number six, if you go to the next page is that burnout is just extreme stress. I know Daniel has talked a little bit already this morning about how that's not true. Burnout is, is a different animal. Um, it's easy to conflate these two and, you know, they're related, but they are not synonymous. The fact is that burnout is characterized by three things, emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and reduced efficacy. So that's sort of our, our working definition. When we say burnout, we're talking about those three things together. While prolonged stress can lead to burnout, it's more than just stress. It's characterized by emotional exhaustion, a detached or cynical view towards work, and a sense of ineffectiveness uh, or lack of accomplishment. So those are, those are the three, when we talk about burnout, that's what we're talking about. So some of you all, we've talked about, you know, is this burnout, is this stress? You might have both, and we'll talk a little bit more later about sort of um, the stages of burnout as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Patty. All right, let's round these out. So fiction number seven is about the story or judgment we tell that only weak or sensitive people are going to experience burnout. So there's something about that person that makes them unable to handle the pressure. The fact about that is that anybody can experience burnout. So the evidence confirms that regardless of their resilience or perceived strength, when they're faced with chronic wor workplace stress and the systemic underlying factors of burnout, anybody can experience the resulting symptoms that we talked about. So none of us are immune. The next fiction is that burnout is a temporary state. Just hang on. You'll get over it. It's a tough season. Everybody's stressed right now. So once that stress is removed, burnout is just going to disappear. But what we know is that systemic change has to happen or else burnout will continue. If the mechanism to create burnout is systemic, we have to change that system that built it. 
So even immediate stressors removed, you, you might you know, have a temporary relief because the workload may be eased up a bit, or you know, that person that was bothering you at work, you're not having to interact with. But if we are still having bad systems that create those sort of outcomes, they will time and time again come back. And finally, burnout does not affect your physical health. Who in this room, when they've been burnt out, felt like they had a physical symptom? Maybe like tension in your neck, headaches, tight jaw. We know, the science says, that every year 120,000 deaths occur because of burnout-related health conditions. Heart disease, increased risk of weakened immune functioning. All of these things leave us susceptible to not only emotional symptoms, but the physical symptoms that come along from having cortisol running through your blood all the time. So these are some of the stories that we want to help to dispel today. And we want to make sure that you understand the science behind burnout so that as we give you some solutions-oriented uh, you know, presentations, you, you are uh, basing that in fact. What we want to do is turn the page. And so what we typically do, um, if you have longer, we want to kind of explain this tool in particular, is you take about 10 minutes to have people work through those questions. And it's just a tooling of sentence completions. Which, which we've found at times can be more helpful than just a question, is just finish the sentence. And so if you look at the first question, it's the burnout fiction I wrestle with most personally is. And so take just 60 seconds and just write down. You know, go back over your notes for a minute. Just uh, what's the burnout fiction that you wrestle with most? So we're aware that this mic doesn't work. And so if you're like, really, like, why is he holding that mic? It's because this is for recording, all right? So I'm going to project my voice. Um, but what you typically do is walk through this. And so whether work, working with executive teams that literally kind of scoff at burnout, um, this has been a highly successful protocol that I've experienced is just walking them through this tool and getting it out. Um, see seasoned executives uh, tear up, you know, as they kind of with a choke voice share the, the burnout fiction they wrestle with. Definitely below the senior management team, there's, there's a lot of tears and a lot um, of powerlessness. And what, what can we do? We're, we're powerless to change the system. And so the purpose of this is for people to self-identify with the misinformation that they're identifying with. And so on Menti, uh, the next uh, slide, I want to put, you can choose up to three. What's the burnout fiction that you wrestle with most? And so typically there's, there's several. Uh, maybe you're like, all of them. I'm a hot mess. That's OK. Uh, but, but choose up to three. But I'm going to transition from this. Yeah. Will you throw those slides back up there? Because I'm going to mess them up. <laughs> yes, I think it might be good for you to make the change after so that his slides go back up. I don't know. Yeah, hold it up. Yeah. Where are his slides? They're on the deck. OK. Right. So the winner. Of burnout in 2023, fiction eight. <laughs> well, yeah, we can clap for that. Let's clap for that misinformation. Fake news, right? Uh, burnout is a temporary state. Uh, or actually, the winner, sorry, whoa, whoa, whoa. The winner is fiction number three. Burnout is a result of poor time management. Yeah, that's pretty pervasive. You just need to manage your time. Uh, 
Up, up, here we go. Yeah, we're at the very end. But then burnout is just about being overworked. Um. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's a temporary state. Oh, it's a tie. Keep them coming. Come on. So, uh, really want to encourage. This has been a very helpful tool in our experience. Um, you have the freedom to adapt these tools. Um, and to work them however you want. That's why we've developed them. Um, we have the tooling at the center. I have the tooling at my website. You can get a Google Doc um, and adapt and change the tool. Because sometimes maybe you're in a culture where you just need to deal with five. You know, it's too many. Um, but uh, there, the one thing we want to encourage is um, tread carefully um, with the topic of burnout. Um, yes, we are complete advocates of being a disruptor, but sometimes that disruption needs to be subversive and savvy. But what we want you to hear most of all is that it requires a lot of compassion um, for ourselves, for even the bullies in our culture. You know, that, that hardened toughness, there, there is a human there as well. And just as those experiencing burnout or those that are powerless can be objectified, so can leaders in power that are abusing their power and need to be held accountable, but they also need to be approached. Um, and we can approach them like humans as well. And so in that theme of compassion, Dr. Brad Shuck, let's give it up for Dr. Brad Shuck. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna unpack compassion and explore what does it mean for us to have compassion towards ourself um, towards our team, towards our workplace, and towards society at large. Man, what a pleasure to be here with you guys today, thinking about this idea of compassion and what it means for burnout. I was on a phone call a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to uh, an executive that had called and said, hey, we need you in California on Tuesday. And it was Friday afternoon. And she was like, you, ha like, you have to get here. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what do you wanna talk about? I don't know, but we need help. Cool, okay, well, sounds great. Um, sounds like an adventure, that'll be fun. Um, and so we started to go through some topics. This person is a, is a highly placed executive at a technology company out in Silicon Valley. And we started to talk about how lonely leadership can be and how, ex how exhausted she felt and how disconnected she was in the moment. And I watched as this executive began to kind of break down a little bit. I mean, someone that, someone that people are looking to in the moment. And then I began to see the thread as I talked to other leaders and other team members, but also people in my own community, my, my next door neighbors, the people that live right next door to me, the people that I go to church with, the people that I'm in band with, the people that I work with here at the University of Louisville, and this idea of extending ourselves over and over and over again as a badge of honor in some way is becoming a distracted exhaustion in many, many ways. This idea of compassion is something that we've talked a lot about over the last couple of years. And I want to share a quote with you from a project that we worked on here with the Center for Positive Leadership. We were really trying to understand where does compassion come from? Because everybody wants more of it, to extend it, to have it. I mean, I would really love it if my wife was maybe a little more compassionate with me at home. Don't, don't tell her I said that if someone in here knows her, so let's just keep, keep that between us. I would love it if my coworkers extended some compassion to me, and we talked a lot about the idea of compassionate leadership throughout the pandemic. Compassion was a word that was very popular. 
And the idea was, well, we can just flip it on like a switch. So we set out to understand where does it come from? What is the source of compassion? And so we interviewed 50 of the world's top leaders, people who are they uh, manage, general managed professional sports teams, and they work in places like uh, NBC, and they run universities across the world. And some of those people are local here to Louisville, and others are in far distant countries. And one of the participants said this, when we asked her what, if, she, if there was one kind of parting thought about compassion, she says, we will not go back to a new, to a normal. That normal will not be acceptable. Now don't miss that. There's hope in that. That normal will not be acceptable because you know this is our chance to forge a new normal. This is our opportunity. This is our moment. This is our call to action. I think it's a chance for everyone to press the reset button if we'll stop long enough to think about what's worth keeping, stopping, and starting. But will we do that? Will we do that? You know, I think it's going to probably be the rare leader that can hold that space. And I love that call that she gives to us today. And I think that's the purpose for us being in the room. That's that call that it could be different. And what would it look like? I love to lead with this question today. What if? What if? What if we get it right? How would it change? How would it change the way you work? How would it change the way you communicate? How would it change the way that you go home at night? What if? What if? When we think about compassion, I think it's important for us to level set what it is. And then I want to dig into the tool. The tool, um, we're going to actually go through some of the exercises in the tool. But before we get there, I want to make sure that we're level set on what this idea of compassion is. When you think about the word compassion, what words or stories come to mind for you? What are the things that you think about? For me, I think about things like, um, Daniel mentioned them early, earlier, love, love, joy, hope. I think about watching people extend compassion. One of the most important things about being compassionate is that we have other people in our lives who role model that compassion is possible. If we don't have somebody in our life where we've seen someone extend compassion to someone else, we do not know that it is a choice. Instead, it's distraction, detachment, perhaps dishonesty. I've heard leaders say, I work with a sense of humiliation, like that's in my toolbox. No, 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 no. No, above the line, di dignity. Dignity is where we want to work from. So when you think about the idea of what compassion is, as we work through these tools together today, I hope that you'll take stories with you because they are incredibly powerful. Now, as we level set what we mean by compassion, academically, compassion has three components to it. A uh, wonderful and beautiful researcher, Jane Dutton, pioneered much of the work that is grounded in the area of compassion. And that work was inspired by a man with the last name of Frost who helped her kind of understand. But Jane really kind of pulled the story of compassion forward. The first is noticing. So to be compassionate, we have to notice. Now, to notice requires a couple of things. First, we have to be aware and outward focused. So there's a shift there. There's an inside out shift that has to happen. We're aware of what's going on around us and I'm outwardly focused. Now, this sounds really easy. It sounds super easy. It's pedestrian even, but it's really hard to execute. It's really, even more difficult to execute when you don't have the resources to be present in the world around you because you've given all you can. This is about a place of capacity. 
Do you even have the capacity to notice? I was walking in a room the other day and um, I must have had my blinders on because I bumped right into someone and they were literally right in front of me. And I didn't see them and I'm like, how did I not see this person? And I was so focused on what I was doing. And my, my daughter um, at the Louisville FC game this past Saturday was walking around with her phone up in her face right? And she's bumping into people. I'm like, Maddie, you're not noticing what's around you. You're distracted. You're distracted. This isn't only about what's happening in the moment, but it's about what could be. It goes back to the root of that question of what if? What if? So to be present requires us to have resources. Now, the second component of compassion is the idea of empathy. Empathy is about being in the meeting, being in the conversation, being in the virtual chat, being on a remote uh, meeting and seeing someone for who they are. There's no judgment, there's common ground here. There's not a sense of like, I see you and I'm judging you, or I see you, no, I see you and I hear you. I notice you, I have empathy for you in the moment. This is not about being soft. This is very much about being authentically human. Now, don't miss that. We're noticing things here, and then we're getting into this space of, I see you and I hear you. The third piece of compassion is perhaps the most distinguishable component. It's a requirement. Up until this space right here, it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling. Oh, I see you, Brad. I feel really sorry for you. I am so sorry that you are walking in the rain. It must be really wet outside. Yep, your clothes are getting drenched. But you don't take any action. Up until this place, it's just nice. Here is where we get kind, where there's an action step associated with it. So I not only notice that I might be walking in the rain, and I feel terrible that Trish is walking by herself in the rain, I happen to have an umbrella, and so I go share that umbrella with her, right? That's the action step associated with it. As a leader, we need the capacity to do that. We have to be present in the moment, we have to have empathy in the situation, and most importantly, there's a bias to action. Don't miss that, a bias to action. I'm going to step into the arena with you. I'll often use the phrase, I'm going to get in the boat with you and row. I'm not going to give you directions. I'm getting in with you. Let's do this together. My wife, as a kindergarten teacher, had a, had a saying that she would tell her classroom all the time. Guys, we can do hard things together. And they would go, yeah, Miss Shuck, we can. We can do hard things together. So when I notice and I have empathy for the person or the situation or the community or the need, and then I take action, that is compassion. That's what it looks like in action. But here's, I think, the challenge that we face. The ability to extend, to, the ability to do those things to see, to have empathy, to take action, comes from resources. It comes from resources that we have available in the moment. I may want to extend compassion, but I physically and emotionally cannot because I am depleted. I am tired. I am exhausted. I am disconnected. I am distracted. I'm in a different place. You know, I think about resources here around time. Do you have time? Maybe for some of us, the ability to extend compassion is around financial resources. Do I have three or four extra dollars to extend to the person behind me in the Starbucks line or the McDonald's line to pay it forward for them? And if I don't, maybe I, I can't do that. Maybe it's about the emotional reservoir that I've got. Maybe it's about feeling burned out myself. But this, make no mistake, burnout is, is a mismatch between resource and demand. 
It's a, it, it's a simple equation, to be honest with you. There's only one way to solve for burnout. You either decrease the demand or you increase the resource. But we can't have it both ways. And so if compassion is a way to build this reservoir, then we need the resource to do that. When we have those, ac those resources, we have access to those resources. I think about words like abundant, enough, authentic, present, empathetic, integrity. Those words that seem so easy to do, but sometimes in the moment can pull from our resources. But when we have access to time and energy, when we're well ourselves, Daniel talked a lot about the physical toll that stress can take. That's true. When we're well ourselves, it changes everything. And here's what's so amazing about extending that umbrella in the rain. It's never expected, but it transforms everything in the moment. See, we don't extend our umbrella to the rain because someone earned it. Trish isn't coming to me because I've earned her umbrella. She sees me. She has empathy for me. And she takes action. And it transforms. In those moments, compassion changes everything. Because no one ever expects it. And that's why having someone in our life who role models that for us can be such a game changer. And I, I want to encourage you, you may very well be that person for the people you work with. They're looking at you saying, look at him, look at her. We need those moments. When our resources dwindle, we can feel burned out and empty. And this is the challenge, right? When we do not have enough ourselves, we can feel empty sitting in our silence. Rather than extending compassion in a transformational way, we extend our resources in a transactional way. This feels forced and blank and bare. Have you ever, have you ever done that? I mean, I know I have. I, I certainly have. I can think of countless incidents where I have gotten this wrong. I didn't do this well. I didn't even do this well at home for my family, let alone the people that I work with. And I've, you know what I've said a lot? I'm sorry. And I've made the next best decision. When we extend ourselves, when we do not have the resources to give, this feels forced, blank, and bare. And there is a cost. There's a cost to that. Sometimes that cost is sleep. Oh, man, I agreed to do this. I'm going to have to stay up late tonight and get this done. Oh, man. Sometimes it's our health. Oh, man. I can feel the physical manifestation of pain in my body from the stress that I'm feeling. Sometimes it's our families. Sometimes it's our communities. Sometimes it's our work. Sometimes it's a bad email. But when we extend what we do not have, there's a cost to that. That's what transaction looks like. So part of abundance, here's where we get to the fun stuff. This is what I love. Part of abundance is found in slowing down. Part of abundance is found in reflection. It's found in awareness. It's found in boundaries, which I'm terrible at. It's found in naming it. It's found in de-escalating. It's found in the power of your stories. It's found in those moments. It's why we recommend so often for people to start their day with a mindful activity. A, a journal, write three grateful words that you have down. Don't overthink it. And they might be coffee, coffee, coffee. And that's fine. You're grateful. It's perfectly fine. But what owns our mind and owns our heart owns our day. And so what we want to do here is to slow down. And this is where we really want to focus some of our time the remaining time that we've got to, to think about this idea of compassion. Now, we're going um, to gonna do some activities. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah? Okay. I want to kind of get into this with you. The, um, 
the tool, if you look in your packet, is Compassion and Burnout Reflection Guide for Self and Team. Wonderfully designed by the Center for Positive Leadership, I might add. And um, this is meant to be a, a guide. This is meant to be a, a set of reflective questions that you can use either on your own. Maybe you want to work through these questions individually. Maybe you want to work through these questions on a, with a team. You have a defined team at work. You have a defined team um, at, at your organization. Maybe you're doing an off-site retreat. You want to spend some time thinking about this idea of compassion and burnout. I would note on page four, there, there are some instructions. There's, there's an overview, much of which I've covered already through the deck this morning. And then there are some instructions. But there is a teaching and facilitation note on page four that I would want to draw your attention to. If we take our time and we find ourselves in a state of reflection and awareness and slowing down and being present in the moment, the guide could take up to an hour. I don't think that's outside the boundaries. And here's the reason why. These questions are, may require us to just sit with them for a minute. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm gonna sit with it for a minute. And I want you to know, that's okay. I'm gonna invite you to sit with that question, to sit in silence. It's gonna require courage to step in. For some of us, we're gonna we're gonna feel the burden kind of release. We're gonna be where it's appropriate, vulnerable. We're gonna honor that space and acknowledge the growth, knowing that each person may answer these questions very differently and that's perfectly acceptable. It's designed to be that way. It will ebb and flow as we need. On page five is where I wanna start. And we've broken this up into a four box model. And this was my attempt at creating a four box model. It's, I apologize for my graphic design skills. But we really wanted to look at compassion and burnout in four different areas. Internal and then external. That there are these internal sources of resource that we've got and we, there are these external sources of resource that we have. Internal are things like what I have here, like what is the, wh where are the resources, where am I drawing these things from? Where's burnout living in this space? The second is the self. Down here external is work and then family. And we broadly define the term family. We know that some people live in traditional types of families and other people live in alternative families where they've got communities of loved ones, circle of friends, trusted colleagues, that they love on. However you define that for you is perfectly fine. But I wanna start on page five. And we're gonna just take a general step forward around, all right, what is this idea of compassion? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you mm, probably about five minutes, just five minutes to think through these questions individually, okay? And I want you to write down as much detail as you can as you read through these questions. Things like, when you think about the word compassion, what does it mean to you? Feeling burned out, exhausted, and depleted is a common experience. And then the last one here, can compassion and burnout live in the same space? And then I'm going to invite you to talk about this at your table briefly. And then we'll walk through the rest of the guide. And I'll show you kind of how that works. But for a minute, I want to practice this sense of abundance and self-reflection here today. So take a few minutes, walk through the three questions on page five, and then in four or five minutes, we'll come back together and I'll ask you and invite you to share at your tables, okay? Awesome. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna rush us, I don't wanna rush us, but I do wanna make sure that you, you have some time to share uh, at your tables, just a little bit. So I wanna invite you to, um, to just maybe take the first question and, and kind of round robin it. You know, talk about what that is, and then maybe if we've got time, we'll move to the second question. But um, completely unstructured, I, I won't facilitate this. I wanna empower you at your tables to kind of begin to walk through these questions uh, where it feels, um, where, when it, how and when it feels right for you. 
So take a few minutes, begin to tell your stories. I'll pull us back together. I'll walk us through the guide and then I'll turn it over to Daniel to introduce our second speaker today. All right, I, I hate to pull us out of these amazing conversations that I know are happening at your table. I know, but I don't want you to miss what happened. When we turned it over and you just got to tell your story and you got to talk through the power of the learning that was happening in here, like did you feel the energy level even just bump a little bit, right? And that's how we create abundance and resource and that's how we create and like access compassion. So if you're using this on a team, think about the kinds of discussions that you might be having. If this is a large team, you can break it up like this. You can send it as pre-work if you wanted to do that. These tools are completely, completely free. If we were to walk through the rest of, uh, of the book here, as you turn into page six and seven, we talk about resources. On a scale from one to five, with one being no resources, five being full of resources, what's your current level of ability to be compassionate? Questions like, what, if any place in your life, do you want or need to increase your resources for compassion? And if you got it right, what would change? And, and, and leaning into naming that has a lot of power, especially as you write it down. When we think about the self, what burdens, if any, are you carrying that are weighing you down, that are keeping you from being more self-compassionate? Where in your life do you need to give yourself permission to be more compassionate with yourself. Look, this is an area that I struggle in. My wife will tell you, I will just push through it. But where are there areas in my life or your life where we can extend self-compassion to ourselves? On pages eight and nine is work and family. I love this question about work. Name two strengths you're most proud of bringing to your work environment. I think if I was to ask you to list all the things that you're not really good at, you could probably give me a pretty long laundry list of those things. But when I ask you to think about your strengths and your gifts, it changes the conversation. Because each of you brings something uniquely special to your work environment. As we think about family, are there habits in your life that are holding you back from me being more compassionate? Over the last few weeks, can you think of a specific time where you can practice compassion with someone in your circle? How did it feel? Name that. And then the final page is just some wrap up questions around making meaning, around making meaning. Look, I, I have been absolutely honored to share this tool with you. I hope you will find it useful. I hope that you'll leave today after hearing all of our speakers inspired and clinging to the question, what if? And with that, I wanna turn it over to Daniel. What a great question, what if? What if, what if our cultures shifted? And I wanna build on that with uh, the next mentee. Where do you feel compassion is needed the most in our society today? What if you could unleash a compassion bomb uh, and invade a specific area of society? What society? And if you go to menti.com, if I can put up the QR code again, if that'd be helpful. It's menti. I'm afraid if I move there right now, go to menti.com and the code is 23446712. Menti.com and it's As it's coming in, I'll share my answer. My answer would be self. Trains. <laughs> Urban noise. I need compassion. Mine would be self. That I believe there's a direct correlation between 
the lack of compassion we extend towards others, and the lack of compassion we give ourselves. Let's see what... All right, there it goes, self-compassion, public spaces, courageous leadership, and our everyday moment-by-moment -moment interactions with others, understanding that we're all human beings, sexual and gender minority, start with our neighbors, families navigating work and childcare with no additional family assistance. I feel compassion is most needed at home, grace with our own inner self, politics, world and all that's in it, for folks who are experiencing something we know nothing of no self-interest, in the household, those we don't know, Again, politics, respect, inclusion, appreciation for those who believe differently. Being comfortable with self, compassion may lead to greater transformed compassion. Understanding not everyone is raised with the same tools for life. Race equity, work-life balance, those who are oppressed. Understanding differences without conflict. More politics and religion. And everyday interaction with others, listening before judging government, anywhere and everywhere, so houselessness issues, addiction issues, mental health issues, family, self, and neighborhoods. Our next conversation, I think, fits perfectly into compassion. How do we practice humility as leaders? And just this week, I've always been so encouraged by the mind and heart of Patty, but just this week, I, I bought a lot of books in the back. It's, it's in the appendix on her recommended reading list, and it's just gold. But more than the treasure of books you can read, I want to introduce Patty Wider. Let's give it up for Patty as she guides us into humility. a job when I was about five months pregnant. So that's about halfway through. And as I started this role, I learned that we were going to be getting a visit from the Office of the Inspector General and within about a year. And that when they came, they were going to be reviewing the mandatory trainings that the person who's in my role should be completing with our staff that are required. And that the role had been empty for two years. So I onboarded, which took quite a while, and hit the ground running. Because I knew I'm gonna be out on maternity leave with my first child. And I gotta get all these you know, schedules blocked ahead so that when I come back, I can just, you know, knock all of this out. And at that time, you know, I was having initial meetings with all of the suggested parties that people said, well, you know, you're going to have to be able to collaborate with these people to be able to get your work done. And it was sort of like, check, check, check. Okay, met that person, met that person blocked these clinics, eh, got kind of um, yelled at at one point by someone for blocking some uh, you know, clinics on a schedule that people had to be in. And, and in my mind, I thought, like, this is all about logistics, and it can get done. So I went out on my maternity leave, which, to be honest, was pretty challenging. I thought it was going to be this blissful time, and it was not, and was excited to get back to work when it was time. And I just was knocking it out, training by training, multiple days a week, going to different places, and, you know, check, 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 check. I was finding, though, in these trainings, I would be meeting with the mid-level manager of the people I was coming to train, and it just kind of felt like they were checking the block, too. This is mandatory training. There wasn't this buy-in. I was teaching people about evidence-based communication skills. I was so excited. They were going to love this because then they would be able to meet the mission of their job more effectively, 
and, and probably have more fun at work. But when I got in those rooms, I would see people staring at me with this kind of disgust at having to be at this training when they have so many other things to do. And inside, feeling like this is not meaningful. People don't really want this. So after probably about a month of just going, 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 staying late at work, you know, having to finish things up, having a you know, newborn at home, so also navigating motherhood, I was exhausted. I was finding myself more cynical about the work that I was doing and feeling that low self-efficacy, all of the hallmarks of burnout. And I was walking out of work one day and ran in to a friend and mentor. His name is Doug Sloan. He had been in the Army for about 20 years before he left and came to service at the VA and had been in the VA for about 10 years. And when I tell you, he is just the embodiment of joy. When you see him walking around, he is not burnt out. He's worked in federal service for over 30 years and is invigorated. And so I talked to him about how I'd been feeling and the struggles I was having. And Doug gave me some really powerful advice and let me know how he's been able to stay in so long in a bureaucracy without feeling that he can't make a difference. The first was about the power of boundaries, having, you know, the end of the day become a ritual. And the other piece of that that ties in with humility is that we have interconnectedness in this system and that the connection we build with other people is the foundation to getting anything done. That the relationships that we build will impact the speed at which we can execute. And he, he just you know, pointed out some little tweaks, how he talks to people when he passes them in the hallway. He doesn't just say, hey, how are you? Fine, fine, okay, how are you? Cool, bye. When he passes people in the hallway, even if he has no time to stop, he'll say, hey, I'm so happy I got to see you. I hope you have a great day. And genuinely mean it. When he has a moment to check in with someone before a meeting, he's going to ask them about that concert that they went to that he knows about or their new grandchild. And he genuinely has a heart to care for people. So I wanted to share that story as I opened up because that allowed me to face the work I was being challenged with in a new way and partner up with Doug to do a lot of work with other people in the organization we were in to feel more connected to their sense of purpose and their team. So this is kind of the introductory slide that you might see and, and you could put facts about yourself up on a slide. For me, you know, yes, I'm a psychologist. I'm currently president of Kentucky Psychological Association, and I have a fellow psychologist that was also on that board with me, Lolly McCubbin. I um, am the marketing chair for Society of Consulting Psychology. I'm, of course, a professional affiliate, Center for Positive Leadership. At the top, I put some fun things in, those like quick facts. I'm a mother of three daughters. They're nine, six, and three. The second was born in my car. That's always my fun fact of a story people don't believe. And then, like, to get to know me, I'm a fan of karaoke. I like to practice yoga, which ugh, someone in the room has taught me before. Um, so these are, like, fun facts, right? But do you really know me based on this? Probably, you know, you don't know me if you've never really gotten to spend time with me. And I think if we put facts about you up on a screen, I'm not going to really get to know you either. So we've got to do more than that. We have to do more than be a collection of facts and roles. We have to know about people. So the first thing I want you to do is just think back on the favorite job that you've ever had. And I want you to recall, you know, at what point in your life you were in that role. What made it special? And I'm gonna make this an interactive sort of, um, you know, event. So um, think about the people that you worked alongside and what type of interactions you had that fostered your relationships. Does anybody want to share maybe what was their favorite job? It doesn't have to be the one you're in now. It doesn't have to be your uh, 
professional role. I worked in an ice cream shop. I worked in restaurants for years. I had a lot of fun teams I've been a part of. Who has a favorite in mind? Yes, I'm gonna go to that uh, table back here. Uh, Park, Ranger. Park Ranger. What was it about that job that you felt made it so special? Connecting to the other rangers and the visitors, the people you're serving. Someone over here. Yes. I was at a movie theater concession. Ah, oh, movie theater concession. What was it about that job that invigorated you? Um, it was like a little cool kids club of nerds. Yes, you found people and had a sense of belonging. That nerd culture. Oh my gosh, I love it. Anybody else a favorite job of mine? Yes, back here. School counselor, what was it about that role? Yes, that sense of purpose, having the representation that you are providing to little girls like you and being that person that maybe you would have loved to connect to as a child. How inspiring every day being able to connect to that. And right here. All right, so your work was allowing others to have the fun that you could provide in that environment, roller rink and laser tag. So we all work in different spaces and we might not all be in a place where we get to play laser tag or facilitate others doing that. Some of the work we do might even be, you know, disheartening and hard and, you know, there are parts of it that can be a challenge. But I just want you to think back and in this moment that you're in right now, express a sense of gratitude for the positive relationships and experiences along your career path that have led you where you are now. All those little touch points, the people along the way, some maybe you developed a deep relationship with, and some are just those people that you interacted with that maybe you didn't even work alongside, but just brightened your day. So as we dig in, we're gonna talk about humility um, and what it is. So, you know, this is a virtue that's been discussed by Aristotle, Confucius, by, you know, all of the great uh, philosophers of history and the modern era. So what do they have to say about it? I can tell you humility is not the opposite of arrogance, which might sound strange. There is a spectrum and humility falls in the center. So you might say it is a virtue between two vices. And I like to think of this spectrum in a horseshoe shape because the two ends of the spectrum are actually closer together than, than you might think about the type of you know underlying emotions, thoughts, and potential behaviors that will result. So on one end of this horseshoe, we've got folks who are self-debasing. They might see themselves as inferior. They might feel weak. They might have low confidence. They might be very dependent on what other people think. They might have that sense of imposter syndrome that is popping up, which I kind of uh, struggle with because a lot of times systems and society can be what is actually perpetuating imposter syndrome, so it's not just on that person. Um, but there's this sense of just really trying to put on the mask, we all wear masks, and on the outside of the mask might be, I'm okay, I know what I'm doing, I'm confident, but on the inside of the mask might be a fear that you're going to be found out, that you're a fraud, that you can't cut it, that this, you know, um, is too much. And then on that other end, of course, is that arrogant side. Someone who maybe has so much pride or ego or vanity that they have an inaccurate perception. They believe um, that their impact might be broader than it is. They might, you know, have a challenge being open to feedback. And so uh, what Aristotle would call the golden mean is the center between these two extremes. So humility is an accurate self-perception, understanding both your strengths and your areas 
for weakness, potential risk, potential growth. Being open to feedback. Being able to share your own fallibility with others. Being able to appreciate the strengths and the expertise of the people around you. And you can't appreciate it if you don't notice it, if you're not aware of it. And then finally, having a transcendent stance or perspective that there is a greater interconnectedness that is not all about me. I'm not the center of the universe. Which, you know, we start out there. Babies, kids, that's where we start. Sometimes it's a challenge for people to move on and, and in our everyday, that disconnection that we have might lead to us forgetting, oh yeah, I'm just one human in all of these other humans on this planet. And I am interconnected. So, um, I, I also wanna say that this can be shaped and expressed within social systems of our life and it also impacts our neurobiology. So there are um, you know, ways that we might practice cultural humility there are ways that we can um, be impacted by the way we were raised or by the systems that we've been a part of. And so being able to recognize we have room to grow is a good place to be. I want to share this with you. It is um, the U.S. Surgeon General's Framework for Workplace Mental Health and Wellbeing. Um, this was designed uh, after research um, looking at 160 million people in the U.S. workforce. Um, and it, uh, you know, points out the factors that are systemic that can impact workplace well-being. And you'll see here, what I really want to point out is it's centered on worker voice and equity. Why would the Surgeon General be concerned about workplace well-being? Well, I can tell you that in a post-COVID world, the epidemic that we are having in um, you know, the psychological practice is loneliness. So 81% of workers want a workplace that would support their well-being. But 44 million Americans, when they asked, reported that in the prior day, they felt lonely most of the day. So we feel disconnected. We don't have a sense of community and belonging that we desire as humans at the core of who we are. And I'm not talking about that outgoing, having to be people-y all the time, because some of us are introverts, so I'm not, this isn't a personality construct. This can be those m moments of interaction. And so the reason the U.S. Surgeon General cares is because we know that we can uplift population health when we impact people at work. So Brad mentioned Jane Dutton, and in a conversation I got to have with her, which was very inspiring, she mentioned the reason that she devoted her career to organizational, uh, you know, positive interventions was that that is how you can scale your impact. People are at work for a large portion of their life for many hours of the day, and when we uplift people at work, that impacts their home, that impacts their community, and that uplifts society. So if we want to see change, that is a place we can start where we can make a big shift. What if, right? And if that's not enough, Oxford University did a study connecting well-being ratings of employees to the stock performance of 1,600 U.S. companies with 15 million employees. So they saw um, a greater return on assets, higher profits, and uh, firm value when their employees had higher well-being. So the next part that I want to talk to you about is high quality connection. Um, the most important part of what I'm going to do today is in activity because we have to practice this. And so uh, Jane Dutton uh, coined the term high quality connection, these positive interactions. They could be a minute. I'm talking very brief. But these times when we connect with another human and we feel seen, energized, and uplifted. This could be in the grocery store line. This could be as you're walking into work and interact with the person at the front desk. This could be even over virtual modalities. Sometimes it's in a chat form. Sometimes it's in a phone call. Sometimes it's a note. It could be asynchronous. But in that moment, you feel seen, energized, and uplifted. 
And we know that these short-term dyadic interactions have mechanisms that we can enhance. So there are cognitive pieces to this, being aware of others, being able to understand the impressions we might be having based on our nonverbals and that you know, we're picking up from them, being able to take their perspective, the emotional aspects of these high quality connections. So um, if you've ever heard of Barbara Fredrickson and the broaden and build theory, when we experience positive emotions, we are more able to learn and um, expand our cognitive outcomes. Um, practicing gratitude, being able to mimic the emotions that we are experiencing with the other person we're interacting with and have that sense of warmth. And finally, there are behavioral aspects. So these are pieces we can practice. Respectful engagement, task enabling, and play, which we'll be talking about. Um, this is all very important in the context of the setting you're in. So I would encourage you to improve high quality connection but when we do this on an organizational level and we shift culture, that is where we can truly see an impact. So um, psychological capital is a, uh, a research term. Um, and uh, when we're talking about humility, uh, Bradley Owens, uh, who does a lot of research, says that humble leaders are essentially self-transcendent. They have successfully tempered or tamed the ego and embraced a leadership perspective that seeks to elevate everyone. So that sense of the greater good. They are teachable, eager to learn, and willing to see themselves accurately and able to praise those around them. They foster in their workplace hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. And how lovely that that lines up with the scientific definition of psychological capital. Being able to foster in others those components of hope, being able to see potential, confidence or self-efficacy, opposite of burnout, right? I can do this. Optimism, being able to attribute some events externally. This is something that won't last forever. It's not all my fault. And also having an internal ownership of maybe some things that are going well. And then resilience, can we cope with challenges and recover in a flexible manner? And so when leaders are able to practice high quality connection and embrace humble leadership, they are building their psychological capital. So before we dig into our activities, I really wanted to emphasize that your brain is a tool for you and our brains are amazing. And one of the greatest skills, as you can see noted here, is the ability to have that perspective taking, to think about the minds of other people, to understand them better. But one of the problems we have is that we are overconfident. We think we can read minds. We might be bogged down in our relationships because there's this interpersonal kind of mush and we feel like we think we know what the other person experienced. And then we're thinking, feeling, and doing based on, you know, our story, which can lead to distrust, which can, you know, um, just kind of get in the way. And so I'm going to hopefully help you to practice some behaviors that can help you to have more clarity, genuine connection, and an ability to execute with other people and build momentum. So our first activity, I want you to pull out the um, Humble Leadership Generator, which you know, has some of the definitions that I've talked about, but I really wanted to be able to walk you through this tool. And to be able to start building humility, the first piece of it is having an accurate perception of self, strengths and weaknesses, fallibility. You are not an expert in everything, but all of you are an expert in something, including your own experiences. So. Um, the first questions there in activity one are going to encourage you to look at your own personal strengths and qualities. So not just a list of accomplishments or achievements, but those things that you are most proud of. Why were you able to do that? What is it that you bring? And I know that this can be very challenging for some people. So I'm going to give you a few moments to look at these questions and make a couple notes. And I'm a big fan of having music to um, liven the mood, so I'm going to play one of my favorite work songs. All right. 
right, I'm gonna call you all back together and I love it when I start to hear the rumbling in the room of interacting and making connections. So I won't ask you to share your strengths out loud in front of the whole room of people, but I encourage you to continually practice some forms of hearing from others to build your awareness about what your strengths and, and unique traits are. So we use a whole host of assessments. In my practice, I like to use a Strengths Finder. I like to use the Hogan Assessment Suite, 360 assessments where we can get information from colleagues and um, direct reports. All of that is data, but you have data in your everyday life as well. You get performance feedback, you can ask for feedback, but being more aware of both sides, the things you struggle with and the things that you do really well is important. And you can leverage those and also mitigate your risk of derailing career because, you know, personality can get in the way if we know that these are potential pitfalls. So also you want to be able to see the strengths around you, to recognize and defer to the expertise of other people. If you are in a leadership role, you cannot do it all. <coughs> Servant leadership is not being able to do everyone else's job and pick up the slack every time and um, know about everything. It is about being able to uplift everyone and having the psychological safety that they can share with you what they need. And yes, you're willing to step in when you can, but it is, it is not about being a martyr. So next, I'm gonna be talking about enhancing your everyday interactions, which is activity two. Um, and for this one, we're gonna end up moving around the room a little bit. Um, so there are some tips here on enhancing everyday interactions. Um, so being able to intensify, increase, or improve the quality, value, or extent of your interactions. And again, if you're an introvert, I don't mean you have to be around people all the time. I don't mean that, you know, the, the number of minutes a day that you interact has to increase. But if we could take the interactions we already have and, you know, be able to make them more high quality, then they can invigorate us and uplift the others that we are present with. Um, so you'll see here some um, tips for respectful engagement. Um, in this activity, I want you to partner with someone at a different table. So find someone else in the room, and I know sometimes that's hard, but um, I, have a, I have a hope that you will all find someone, and if not, come find me. Um, and uh, there's gonna be two people, so a dyad, person one, whoever wants to do it, Share about your most meaningful times that you connect to your sense of purpose at work. And person two, don't ask questions, don't jump in, let them speak and try to practice your active listening. Let them know that you genuinely wanna hear their story. And then give them a reflection on what you heard from them. So you might highlight, hey, this is a personal strength I hear from you, or that's really important to you, or whatever it is. Just at the end of the you know, two minutes I'm gonna give you, give them a reflection back, and then switch roles, okay? So your, your instruction is you've got a minute um, for the first piece of finding a person, share about your most meaningful times you connect to sense of purpose at work, and, um, and if you're person two, try to wait, don't speak, don't have a question, don't think of what you're gonna say, just listen, and then give a reflection at the end, and then I'll, I'll have you all switch. So let's go. I feel like we just uplifted the energy in the room. I think, I think maybe that high quality connection was happening, and I think the, the quality of the way that you can um, attend, listen, genuinely show that caring can change the dynamic. So did anyone in here learn something about the person they interacted with? Yes, yes, okay. Do you feel more connected to that person now? All right, and, and do you feel like that was uplifting? Specifically talking about that, the sense of purpose that you have in your work. So connecting to that sense of purpose is important. And not only doing that in the tasks of your work, but also in the way you connect to other people. 
So the next activity that we're going to do ties in with the humble inquiry section of the humble leadership generator. And I just wanted to point out, um, again, you know, Aristotle was pretty big on virtues. And, and he really emphasized that we become virtuous through acting in virtuous ways, through practicing the behaviors of virtue. And so, um, you know, being able to lead with humility also will lead to a well-lived life, something that's called eudaimonia. But the concept that we are striving, pushing limits, finding success, achieving something difficult, that having an easy life is not a life well lived. And, you know, being able to face disappointment and failure and understand that we are never done improving and that we can hone our strengths and work on our weaknesses through our, throughout our lifespan. So I want you um, to be able to think about the ways that you can use questions to deepen the connections that you have with folks. And this is not only in the workplace. Um, I, I titled this humble inquiry, which is a term that comes from Ed Shine, who is an OD um, researcher and practitioner who passed away earlier this year. Um, and I was actually able to uh, witness an interview of him in the final 24 hours of his life. He was a part of an OD uh, practice circle that he dialed in on and was answering questions about humble inquiry. Um, and, and you just never know, you know, what is coming next. But he has written a lot about humble inquiry, humble leadership, humble consulting. And you can see his definition there of what humble inquiry is. And so it is not just the science of this, but the art of evoking from other people answers. So we can build the relationship, but we can also get to the heart of things more quickly when we ask questions in a way that leads to something important. So in this next activity, you're gonna again partner with someone at a different table. I think it's nice to shake it up a little bit and, and interact with people we don't already know. Um, and uh, ask some genuine questions. So I'm gonna let you choose, because I want it to be a, a question you truly wanna know the answer to. Um, so select a question from that page. There are many options. And again, I want you to just practice that active listening. So, you know, being able to um, visibly see through things like eye contact that you are present with the person. Being able to remain open to hearing their answer. And being able to understand that they have some expertise that you may not have that they can share. So, um, you know, in the exercise, you know, you might be doing this with people that you work with that are on your team or that you're leading. Um, but again, we can enhance the questions that we are able to ask of any person that we interact with. So I'm going to give you another song's worth of time. Um, and I want you to find someone new that you can partner up with. And you don't have to ask the same question of each other, but select one on that page of Humble Inquiry and practice being a humble listener while also being able to express some genuine positive attributes about yourself, your workplace, or um, any other, other answers you may have. So let's go, let's practice. Thank you all for participating. I really am grateful for you all to be here. So I'm wondering, in that three and a half minutes, that's all it took, what did you learn about someone else? Yes, Brad? Chelsea just bought a Harley Davidson. All right. Awesome. Something new, right? She has a helmet and she is blinging that helmet out. Amazing. I got you, bro. Anybody else? What did you learn about someone? Yes. I learned that me and Michelle are the exact same person. The ex I you felt a sense of representation in someone that, that aligns to you in some way. Yeah, it was wild. You know, it's amazing how that happens sometimes. Melissa and I live on the same street. We figured that out after we were both being presenters on this. 
And um, another one of our Center for uh, Positive Leadership affiliates lives the next street over. So we're just like having a Tyler Park neighborhood positive leadership cluster. Anybody else, something you learned about someone? Yes, Rachel Carter. It's my little sister. Same age as your girls? Okay. Older than yours, I'm taking it. Older than yours? So, someone you could look up to, like you've made it through these ages with your kids. Hers are six and four, so. Um, so, in that small amount of time, three and a half minutes, you forged an authentic connection with someone based in the type of question that is appreciating them and drawing out, you know, information you really want to know about. So the more we can practice using questions like this, humble inquiry, you can look into the uh, you know, research about appreciative inquiry and that style of intervention, which I love to use. Um, you know, being open and asking about the things we truly want to know about, not just for the sake of, hey, hey, how are you, how are you? you know, do you really wanna know? So um, ask things you wanna know about. And as a leader, cultivate spaces that you can have that true dialogue. So the final thing that I want to practice here is talking about the rituals we have in the workplace. Um, I outline an activity that you could do. So once you're building this foundation of enhancing interactions and you know, having that accurate perception of self, appreciating and naming the strengths you see in other people and expressing the gratitude for them, for them being a part of your team. I mean, Anne can tell you, I love to do a gratitude waterfall. I did one with her team and it was like, we love all of the other people in this room, truly. They bring something different. So, you know, when we can make these series of things that happen regularly in our workplace, we can change culture. We can help anybody new coming into our organization to onboard in a way that allows them to have a sense of belonging quickly, to recognize what they are bringing to the organization. And so, you know, I outline a way that you can do this with your teams, um, but for us here today, I want us um, to think about the established rituals that you might already have in your workplace and come up with one out of the box idea. It can be truly just, you know, wave a magic wand and everything's great. Let's do something wild. How can we radically uplift workplace well-being and performance? How can we shift culture? We can cultivate fertile spaces so that there is psychological safety and continuous process improvement and innovation. So I want us to do this as a, a big group here. Um, I want you all to think of one of the rituals in your workplace. It could be onboarding, it could be the way you celebrate or reward people, it could be what do you do at holidays, how do you huddle, what, you know, what's a busy you know, time of the year for your team and what's it like when you're in that space. What happens when you reach a milestone on a project? Any of these things. You might not have a defined ritual, but what do you all end up doing? So think about that in the space of the work that you do. And what is one way that you would say, in an ideal world, this is what we would do and how we could really have a sense of connection and having a ritual or tradition to make the people who work here feel more embraced and connected. So does anybody have a rich, uh, maybe an established ritual in mind that you already have? Anybody got one? Yes. Um, so at our office, uh, I introduced this called a water party. Okay, what's a water party? So basically we found out that three o'clock is like the, the worst part of the work day. Mm -hmm. It's fatigue, they're gonna sit too long, they're dehydrated. Uh, so we introduced the water party where we just go, literally go grab water, take a 15 minute break and uh, talk about some <coughs> and, and more personal. I love it. When I tell you, Priya Parker wrote a book about the art of gathering, that is truly a sense of embracing workplace well-being, we need to hydrate, understanding the timing of it and when it would be most impactful, using it as a space to connect, and that becomes fruitful, right? People want to be a part of water parties, right? It, it spiraled out of control because the whole office started doing it. Really? Okay, so you know, sometimes there's good trouble. It worked really well, though. Everybody really enjoyed it, and that's the thing. Everybody enjoyed it, and all the managers said, Where's everybody going? And I said, We're going to 
Oh yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit on that point very next slide. So um, anybody else? One more ritual. Let me think about because we don't have a ton of time. Anybody else got a ritual that you know you'd love to tweak in your workplace? Yeah, oh yes. A bar manager, uh huh? Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you have an end of the day ritual of gathering already, but it maybe is bogged down in the validating and, and connecting on the shared sense of, wow, this part of it was really hard, which is important, but it might be nice to also highlight some things we were grateful for with each other or maybe a customer. Um, me and my kids like to do something that I cannot claim because I stole it from a very good friend of mine who Ann also knows, um, where we show, share a rose, a thorn, and a banana at the dinner table. So rose, what went well in your day, thorn, what was hard, and a banana is something silly. So that is just always helps us to connect after feeling very disjointed. Um, so I'm going to close out here um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to switch the slide then. The point you brought up, don't miss the managers. I won't harp on this, I think you all know. If we do not embrace mid-level management in the culture shift that we are embarking on to radically uplift well-being, they might not be able to um, make the shifts that we would like to see. They can't understand why a water party would ever benefit the metrics we're you know, trying to achieve. So make sure that they are a part of implementation. Lift them up. What are their strengths and how can they be a part of the change? And please connect with me. So I have cards out front if you prefer that. Um, my LinkedIn is at the bottom of your Humble Leadership Generator. Um, my information is here as well. Again, my name is Patty Whiter, and I hope that we can build a high-quality connection. Thank you all.